Welcome to episode 119 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Today, I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Darren, who is the most awesome Civil War nerd I know. And I am your co-host, Mary. And we have a very special episode for all of you today. First of all, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth R. Varon. She is the Langbourne M. Williams Professor of American History at the University of Virginia and a member of the Executive Council of UVA's John L. Now III Center for Civil War History. Her books include Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Lu, A Union Agent in the Heart of the Confederacy, and Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War. Her recent book, Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War, won the 2020 Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize. And she is also joining us today from Oxford, England, making her our first Across the Pond guest. So welcome, oh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And congratulations. 119 podcasts is a lot of podcasts. So that's thank you. a lot of, a lot it of is. hard, lot of hard work. We are in this, yeah. in this in this time of Thanksgiving. We thank you for yeah. joining us as well. Oh, so my, it's, my, it's, my, it's my pleasure. It's it's always good to be <laughs> back home vicariously here. At yeah. this, uh, yes. Although o Oxford's a wonderful place. I highly, highly oh, recommend it. Yeah. Well, today we're gonna we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna, we, you know we, we we talked about a lot of people in the Union and the Confederate side, and, and we're gonna talk a lot about James Longstreet, which is the subject of of uh, Bliss's book. And I think it's safe to safe to say that he's probably one of the more enigmatic guys when you really study him, and, and usually when you look at someone, they're the seeds of their psyche is set when they're young. And he's a guy has was age went he changed to a point where it was almost a complete, you know, 180 from his, from his total attitude. And I think what's what's neat about him is he doesn't make any apologies for it. He does. You know, but early in the war, he, he talks about um, about the north, the north attempting to make the Negro your equal by declaring his freedom. And then by the end of the war, he says it's to relieve the distress of the people and to provide for their future comfort. This is not a subtle change. This is a complete sea change. And I think as people study James Longstreet, he, um, he's a fascinating, fascinating study. So your book is, is just fantastic in that regard. Well, thanks. I mean, you know, I was drawn to this story because of this remarkable political about face, I say, you know, uh, in the hook for the book is the most remarkable political about face in American history. There might be a more remarkable one, but I, I can't think think of it. Uh, just as you say, he was very much an ardent uh, Confederate from Manassas to Appomattox, as the title of his memoir ran, a product of plantation society who, uh, uh, at the beginning of Reconstruction, embraces Reconstruction, Congress's bold program for remaking the South, the centerpiece of which was Black voting. He catches all kinds of flack from former Confederates for it. And as you suggested, he then, you know, doubles down. So a, a lot of things brought me to this project, one of which was a sense that, you know, here's a guy who had a nearly 40 year career as a Republican political operative. Uh, and we know very little about it. You know, his, his, his war years have been have been studied carefully, his performance battles of Gettysburg, especially sort of litigated and relitigated and all that's fascinating. And I hope we'll talk about it. But but that post-war political career uh, was really consequential in its own way. And and he left a massive record of it. He has a bit of a reputation as being a kind of stern, gruff, you know, man, a few words. But but I found him to be a really voluble, pr prolific, you know, writer and speaker who loved to kind of, you know, lean into an interview and pontificate about this, that and the other thing. And, and he mused a lot about all of the issues that were besetting American society during during Reconstruction. So um, I wanted to, to uh, you know, bring some kind of balance, understand all of the phases of his life, not not just the wartime phase. He lived a long uh, an eventful life, including a, 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 a sort of surprising second marriage to a woman, you know, 40 odd years, his uh, his junior uh, uh, in 1897. So um, it, it's it's a it's a window because he lived such a long time and had so much to say. It's a window into of the 19th century, you know, um, and historians love a story where you the narrative arc covers this huge span of time, you know, born 1821, oh. died 1904. That takes us through all of these these periods of American history with him as a as a window and a kind of interlocutor. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I think too, like Longstreet, as you said, like he's got this forty year career afterwards, and I think it's like a 
there's quite a few figures in the Civil War that we just study that 1861 to 1865. Exactly. And then we stop and we don't look right. at, you know, and Longstreet's one of those guys where, you know, the Civil War in a way, it, you know, he doesn't make himself any friends. Yeah. The Civil War That's in right. the South. And, 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 you know, I think you, you make a great point. We, we do sometimes tend to, to put the Civil War and Reconstruction into separate silos, but of course they're totally connected. Reconstruction begins during the war in all the places that the Union Army uh, penetrates. So you can't really think about or understand one without thinking about and understanding the other. Uh, and, and uh, you know, for me, one of the fascinations to get back to, uh, um, you know, uh, what Darren said about, about a person's life choices being somewhat determined uh, when they're when they're young, uh, you know, Longstreet's critics, once he makes this decision, and we'll, we'll probe the decision, I'll, I'll, I'll offer, you know, what I take to be an explanation for it. Once he makes this decision to support the Republican Party, some of his Confederate critics will argue sort of after the fact that, oh, you know, it's not surprising he's a traitor to the lost cause. His heart was never in it. And that's why he performed badly at Gettysburg. And that's why he disobeyed Lee and so on. And in, in a way, it would have been convenient for me as a biographer if I'd found evidence that his heart wasn't in it during the war, you know, mm -hmm. that there was some kind of foreshadowing, you know, of his later, his later, uh, you know, change of of uh, of tack. But but his heart was in it during the war. He was a very ardent Confederate. You know, some of these these Confederate leaders, including Lee, were somewhat reluctant secessionists, got on board once secession was a fait accompli. Longstreet was not reluctant. He 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 rushes into the Confederate Army. Um, he was a uh, you know a, a deep South you know born and bred. His uncle Augustus Longstreet, who became in effect his surrogate father after Longstreet's own father died, um, was one of the leading pro-slavery ideologues in the South. Just a man who you know full of kind of frothing invective against the North, anti-abolition, mm -hmm. and all the rest. Uh, and and he was a big influence on Longstreet. Longstreet, you know, cut his teeth in the Mexican War, serving uh, in the army. He was, a, you know, believed in the in, in American expansion and in the expansion of slavery as an institution. Uh, and and his uncle, in a sense, in the political environment in which he grew up, slaveholding plantation society, sort of bred him to carry the Confederacy's banner into battle, and that's exactly you know what he does. So recognizing that that you know thinking about longstreet's ideology and he d he did have one during the war um uh, uh just kind of up the ante for me on explaining his turnaround you know uh uh, uh so so it it's it, it you know there's just sort of layers and layers of of uh of you know puzzles to solve here with this with this man yeah well, i mean if you go back you mentioned earlier you know this is a guy who's born in january 8th of 1821 in edgefield county south carolina which was a um, which was a tough town, admittedly. Uh, the movie does get it right. His family was Dutch married. They got that one right. They came to New Jersey, <laughs> yeah, right, New York, right, right. right? But I mean, Edgefield, it, it, it was one of those places where it was, I think they called this along the lines of the, the, just a national trouble, troublemaking type of town. Yeah, and that yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot and, of, a lot of pro-slavery militants yeah. came from that and, so and it, states' rights militants yeah. from that, that, so, that region, right. By age nine, you know, he's, he's in the way with Augustus Longstreet, who is a fire eater, or people I, or we like to call you know, fun lovers on this podcast, <laughs> you know what they were. And from 1830 to 1838, he's living with him and he's having his head filled with this. You know, yeah. Augustus, he owned that plantation, but he wasn't a very good owner. I think he had yeah. about a dozen slaves and he just, it just didn't work out too well. But he, he would instill this idea in his head. But it's interesting is we'll, we'll jump ahead a little bit later on when he gets older. When he starts writing his infamous Jew letters late to the media yeah. later on, Augustus is telling him, Jim, what are you doing? You're destroying yes. your time. And so yeah. you can see how Augustus' mindset never changed. That's and exactly James, right. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. James, is, it did. And yeah. when we talk about to fill in the gaps here, how it happened, um, it, it's just a fascinating thing. You know, he, he ends up getting into West Point by a guy named Reuben Chapman is going to get him into West Point. And he's going to, for the most part, he's going to... Um, not exactly, just like Mary, not a very good student. Mary was too busy to party at school, right? That's what he was. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he had a reputation yeah. of, have, of having, a, having a good time, enjoying life a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, of course, he, one very important thing happens there, and he meets a guy named U.S. Grant. Mm -hmm. you he know? does. And, and in he a does. sense, you know, the 
the, the, the you know, Augustus Baldwin Longstreet is sitting on one shoulder and U.S. Grant sitting on the other, you know, at a certain point. And, and he and Grant uh, become fast friends, different kind of personality types, but nonetheless, they become very, very good friends. Their families become friends, their wives become friends. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, that friendship lasts throughout the antebellum period. It, you know, the war interrupts it, but, um, but uh, the friendship will loom large for Longstreet later. And, and, and the way I, I sort of explain this in the book is to say, Longstreet doesn't lose faith in the Confederate cause per se, but he does lose, lose a measure of confidence in it over the course of the war. He does become, he does become uh, somewhat demoralized. He begins to brood on what he sees as the failings of the Confederacy. His, his mood is definitely darkened uh, in a terrible stretch of the winter of 1862 when he loses Longstreet three small children to scarlet fever in the space of a week. Um, and thereafter, he becomes, you know, preoccupied with Confederate problems, logistical problems. He feels his men are always, you know, uh, perennially undersupplied. Uh, bad tactical decisions will come to Gettysburg, but he 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 has questions about the the way the war is being waged, at strategic and tactical and operational uh, level. He's not a fan of Jeff Davis's, uh, and that that uh, that you know, animus is only going to. Uh, only going to get deeper. And he begins to feel really to brood over the fact that the Confederates have a, as what he sees as a fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw is, is what he calls hubris or arrogance. He feels that uh -huh. the Confederates make the mistake of underestimating their opponents, that they make that mistake again and again, whether the opponent is McClellan or, 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 or Grant. And he, he, you know, he starts to warn his fellow Confederates about Grant and to say, look, this man, this former good friend of mine, this man who Longstreet respects so much, he, his message is essentially Grant is, will make us pay for our dysfunction in a way that no other Northern general has. So we better beware. This is not a man to underestimate. You know, he starts making those warnings when Longstreet's out West briefly uh, and Grant is out West in the Western theater too. Um, and he carries those warnings back east as, you know, Grant faces off with Lee. And and essentially, you know, the, the, that friendship looms so large at Appomattox. You know, part of the argument of my book is when we think of Longstreet, we think of Gettysburg, but we ought to also be thinking about Appomattox and New Orleans and Gainesville, Georgia. There's some other places uh -huh. that are just as important in his life. And, you know, what happens at Appomattox is that Grant offers these incredibly generous terms the following sort of signals from Lincoln, that, you know, to be generous in victory. And Longstreet interprets the terms through the lens of their friendship. You know, this is right. the Grant he had known and loved, you know, and, and the purpose of Grant's terms isn't to, isn't to exonerate the Confederates. It's to, it's to, it's to uh, motivate them to atone and repent and comply and submit, you know, and he want Grant, Grant wants to change hearts and minds as we might, as we might put it today. And Longstreet accepts uh -huh that offer in the spirit which grant yeah. made it yeah well, that's we, like we, i i'm um, oh. sorry um so in your book though you have it like i really love how you have it divided up there's these three long streets there's long street right. the civil war there's the reconstruction and then there's this reconciliation yeah well. exactly yeah 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 and 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 you know the the um appomattox the generosity of grant the, an encounter he has with Longstreet in which he sort of extends a hand of brotherhood uh, to him. Um, this frames Longstreet's responses to the to the to the post-war uh, period. I, you know, I should I should. And before we get into that, I should note and this this is really, really important and, and, and can't be emphasized enough. At the moment, the war closes. Longstreet is still considered one of the great Confederates by by Confederates by by white Southerners, um, uh, uh, he he is not seen by any means in any way as a, as a scapegoat or a man you know uh, who who should bear any special blame for Confederate defeat. Um, uh, indeed, he is you know uh, when he initially asks for a pardon and is turned away from the Union. Uh, Andrew Johnson and and Secretary of War Stanton say it to him essentially, well, you can't be pardoned. You're rebel number three after Jefferson yeah. Davis and Robert E. Lee. You know, you were the highest ranking rebel. And that's important to note. You know, I think people people sometimes imagine that 
especially in, in, in Virginia, where I'm from, that's, you know, Stonewall Jackson was Lee's right hand man. Well, no, Longstreet was Lee's right hand man. Longstreet was second to Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia chain of command. And, and even after Gettysburg, Longstreet's reputation among Confederates is is intact. And of course, this is so important to emphasize because part of what the book argues is that the scapegoating of him for military defeat is a political backlash. It's right. a response to those decisions later. So, you know, let's let's rewind a little bit to 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 Gettysburg. You know, Longstreet for sure, as has been well documented, has his doubts about about uh Lee's, uh, you know, proposed tactics on the second and third day of the battle. Longstreet wants to fight uh, on, you know, high ground, a good defensive ground of the Confederates choosing to get between the Yankees and Washington, D.C. to dislodge from this very unfavorable position on the low ground, staring up at the strong Yankee defensive position at Gettysburg. He makes known to Lee these these qualms. Lee sort of brushes him off in a way that I think hurts Longstreet because he's used to Lee taking him him seriously, uh, you know, a disaster on the second day uh, ensues. Longstreet's uh, offensive begins later than Lee would have liked, although Longstreet at the time, you know, uh, believed that the delays were necessary to maximize the Confederates' chances of, 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 uh, of, of victory on that day. The third day, you know, Longstreet regards as a hopeless assignment, well, you know, what we remember as Pickett's Charge. The second day, he regarded as sort of his pro a problematic assignment. The third day, really a hopeless one. But he does his duty and, and um, you know, the keynote of Longstreet's own in the moment accounts of Gettysburg is that he ultimately defers to Lee. He does his duty. He, he, he does as Lee asks, despite his doubts about the plan. And, and, you know, historians obviously have endlessly debated whether Longstreet deserved to be scapegoated the way he will be. Uh, and, and um, you know, whether this is a guy who's guilty of, of, of outright sabotage of Lee's plan, of, of willful disobedience, you know, whether he deserves most of the responsibility or even the sole responsibility for Confederate defeat. And I think the sensible position that the kind of consensus view among scholars, although there's a sort of broad spectrum of debate, is that, yes, he was ambivalent. He had his doubts. He made missteps, but it wasn't sabotage. You know, it wasn't and it by no means bears the the sole responsibility. There was a lot of blame to go around among Confederates, mm -hmm. Ewell and Stewart and others, and Hill for the the and, and Lee himself, as Longstreet will point out down the line. You know, for me, the key takeaway here was that to get back to another angle on the point I made about Longstreet's reputation at the end of the war, at the end of the Gettysburg campaign, his standing is as high as ever. He, the Confederates do not blame him or single him out for blame at that moment. Neither the Confederate press nor the high command nor the nor the public. So that tells you something about uh, about what's to come. Well, you see, you see a lot, especially after Gettysburg, and we saw it happen to Jeb Stewart too, where people like uh, Walter Taylor and guys like right. Marshall are going right. to write a different narrative. Right. This came later to protect to protect Lee. Now, Absolutely. you mentioned before, Longstreet had concerns coming out of Chancellorsville about the over arrogance of the of the Confederate Army. And they, and they just were. You're going to go from you're going to go from two corps to three. You're going to have right. two guy, Ewell and A.P. Hill, going to be taking over corps now with Stonewall being gone. And he's under the impression that the game plan is we're going to what you just said, we're going to fight defensive. Lee goes off the grid, changes his plan, and Longstreet's like, I don't think we should be doing this. We should be fighting mm -hmm. defensive. But oh, everybody knows that story. But um, I think at that point, the Confederates, like, like they're in Vegas hitting 21 on a heater. Everything mm -hmm. yeah. is yeah. Everything's come since Second Manassas. Everything's coming out right. Well, probably from seven days, actually. But now you get beat, and they need a reason. And you see, yeah. it, you see it a lot when you read – specifically John Mosby's memoirs yeah. about how they kind of singled out Jeb Stewart for getting running around, getting his name in right. the papers and right. all that. Right. And so you see with Longstreet, but, but, you know, to your point, where the train goes off the track is the post-war. Yeah. It's when, it's when he realizes, okay, you know, he knew, we've said this before, the, 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 the generals knew the war was over. The politicians did. So you had the Longstreet Ord fiasco. Yeah. They're going to try yeah. to settle that. But then yeah. Halleck and Stanton put the kibosh on that. Yeah. So they, they they knew. But when the war ended in, you know, Longstreet has that famous not yet quote and is all yeah. that. But when it finally did happen and he had a chance to see the terms they got, 
He supported it. And by simply doing the whole, we tried our best, we lost, we need to move on. That's really what kind of started to get it going. But I think once he finally got into New Orleans and he yeah. started to have some very radical changes about how blacks were to be treated in the South, how especially when he got that, he got the job at the customs house and he was in charge yeah. of the New Orleans militia, where now yeah. you've got rebel number three hinting that blacks should be able to vote. They should yeah. be able to be on certain types of juries. Yeah. I can put them in my militia. And yeah. it, 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 and that's really when you really start to see the D.H. Hills and the Jubal Earlies where he crossed that line. And ever since that point, it seems like the, the divide is getting worse and worse for Longstreet. And that, that's really what, and your book tells a story very, very well, that that's really when the, the narrative begins. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it, of course, it fascinated me. How, you know, how can you explain why he would take the stance he, he did. He's swimming against the, the tide. So, you know, what I end up uh, exploring and arguing is that, you know, he, he comes to the end of the war. His family has been battered. He wants peace and prosperity and security for his family, looks around the landscape. He has to sort of decide, who am I going to trust? Who, who's going to bring peace? You know, the Jefferson Davises are still talking tough, don't seem to realize the war is over. Uh, Andrew Johnson is showing his true colors as an old Southern Democrat and pardoning all these former Confederates, letting them come back into power and impose something very much like slavery on, on freed African Americans. The Southern Democratic Party seems to want to use politics to kind of wage war by other means. You know, he's just not inclined. You know, those those don't look like good options. On the other hand, you have you have Grant. And, and the Republican Party, who are who do seem in Longstreet's eyes to want peace and prosperity. Well, you know, Longstreet, one of the things he concludes uh, at the end of the war is that the North won, not, not because of uh, brute force, but because free labor society proved superior. Uh, the leadership proved superior, the, 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 the productivity proved superior. He wants, to, he, he sees, uh, uh, you know, in, in the, the North's thriving, a potential future for the South, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, again, a future of, of prosperity. So he writes these letters as Congress is trying to overturn Andrew Johnson's sort of disastrous uh, presidency. And Congress is saying, look, you know, we we won the war. We got to, you know, we got to be in charge of, uh, of, of the peace here. Congress uh, uh, hits the reset button on Reconstruction, says, let's start over, let's enfranchise African-Americans who were such important contributors to the Union victory, uh, uh, particularly in their role as Union soldiers. Um, let's form new governing coalitions in the South and really try to modernize the region. And Longstreet is, is asked, you know, what do you think about all this? The vast majority of former Confederates of white Southerners reject it out of hand. Um, uh, and he says, you know, let's let's give this a try. The surrender of my sword was my reconstruction, just as you you all have said, you know, his attitude was. There was political differences between the North and the South. We appealed to arms to arbitrate the, the differences. Guess what? They won. And that means that we have to play by their rules now or at least try. And his feeling is some white Southerners are going to have to assume the responsibility for making this work or you're not going to have peace and prosperity. So he writes his letter saying, let's give Reconstruction a chance. And he's absolutely blown away by the ferocity of the backlash. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the reactions to those letters, I mean, when I first, you know, read them, I was, it, it's shocking. People are, you know, they call him every name you can imagine, Lucifer, Judas, you know, Benedict, Arnold, whatever. They, You know, they also say, oh. we wish he had died of his wounds in the wilderness. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, and he and 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 the back the ferocity of the backlash, and, and I'm sort of building up to where uh, Darren took us with you know Longstreet's commitment to the Republican Party and to Reconstruction and all the ways he showed that he is his his reaction to the backlash is to is to double down on on his commitment to the Republican Party because the way that the former de Confederates are behaving just vindicates him in the idea that these guys don't want re really want peace. Um, so so he doubles down and and it, it's almost impossible to to conjure for readers and, and listeners and viewers, you know, uh, uh, especially since the party labels have shifted in meaning many times, many, in many ways over time. 
for a white Southern or a Confederate, the Republican Party is the party of Lincoln. It's the party of the Union. It's the party of emancipation. It's the party uh, of abolition and so on. And, and you know, so, so to them, it, it's, it's uh, you know, Republicans are the enemy. Longstreet commits himself to the Republican Party. And then, although there were any number of off ramps, ways he could have backed off, he doubles down again and again and again. And when he is in office, U.S. Grant makes him, as you said, appoints him to the Custom House in a patronage position. Um, Longstreet surprises everyone. He uh, he hires African-Americans to work in, in, in the Customs House, civil service jobs open to them for the first time. In the South, he uh, leads an interracial militia. And in that interracial militia, there are Black colonels and lieutenants and Black generals. Uh, he, he celebrates and encourages uh, black military service, and he praises these black officers. As, as you've implied, so much of, of this story is a story of New Orleans and what an absolutely yeah. unique and distinctive setting it was. And I think that Longstreet's post-war life would not have played out the way it did if he had moved to Georgia or South Carolina or some other place. New Orleans is a, is a character in this story because New Orleans has this yeah. incredible sort of Afro-Creole uh, uh, class, uh, leadership class of men who had been officers, commissioned officers in the Union Army during the war and, and who have this kind of bold vision of an egalitarian society. And Longstreet is impressed by these guys. He's impressed by PBS Pinchback. He's impressed by these black soldiers. And that and, and so in, it, the way I put it in the book is to say this environment is you know, uniquely able to change the ways he thinks about race relations. Well, it, it's it turns into a base of like a, a soul simmering powder keg, and you know, yeah. oh, you know, it's you, a powder you, keg. You know, you, know, you mentioned, yeah. but you know, guys like Henry Warmoth, you know, yeah, people people like this aren't really household names in, in this right. history. But right. I mean, these 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 are African Americans put in these positions. Um, and, and so when when you look at when you look at some of the things that these people did, you can only imagine. I mean, they're going to create these three regiments, and for the more, one white and two black regiments, um, guys like Alexander Barber, you know, Barbour. Yeah. I don't know how you pronounce his name, but it's it's yeah. but, it, but it's but it's one or the other. You know, these are people who Longstreet is going to, for the most part, be in charge of, and you're going to end up with that Colfax massacre that's going to take place. Um, I mean, just... New Orleans becomes, you know, it becomes the scene of a series of pitch battles in the streets, essentially, as as this, you know, these re Republican coalition government that consists of enfranchised African-Americans, some northern transplants to the region like Warmoth, and then some white southern Republicans willing to kind of give this experiment a try. This coalition will be just besieged from the word go because ex-confederates simply the most of them simply won't they they simply won't accept that they're legitimate and they simply won't accept that the republican party has a right to participate mm -hmm. in, in southern politics and so we have you know long street deals very early on with the community and the ranks of this militia with you know various uh, uh you know attempts to form shadow governments uh, to contest the legitimacy of the Republican government. And then finally, in 1874, remarkable moment, September 14th, a battle on Canal Street in New Orleans, in which mm -hmm. Longstreet is literally leading a mixed race, you know, state militia against some of the men he led when he was a Confederate general. You know, those, those men, the so-called white leagues, are trying to overthrow the duly elected government Republican government of, of New Orleans, and they briefly succeed before the federal army, you know, yeah. comes and restores order. So, you know, he, it, you, you can't imagine a more dramatic, mm -hmm. you know, uh, turnaround. And, and, and to but get back to the earlier points you both made, the key thing here is that when do the Jubal Earlies and the William Nelson Pendletons start to attack Longstreet in, in print and their speeches, 1872, 1873, at the peak of his influence in New Orleans at the peak of his commitment to, to, to radical reconstruction. And I'll say one, one more thing before I make way for another question and that, that this is super important. You know, Longstreet was not, alas, you know, he wasn't Thaddeus Stevens. He wasn't Frederick Douglass. He wasn't a perfect racial egalitarian, uh, you know, by the standards of the abolitionists. What he thought was Blacks have a right to be constituents. They have a right to vote. They have a right to some minor leadership positions under, you know, sort of subordinate to peaceable progressive whites. But even that limited challenge to the old ways was enough to make him 
just a clear and present danger to 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 white supremacy and to and to the lost cause type. So even a limited challenge from someone who himself was, you know, Longstreet perfect absolutely imagined that whites should control Southern politics. He just felt that there was room for African Americans uh, in that polity. And but most Confederates wouldn't accept any participation by, no, by African Americans. No. And, you, and you mentioned that the, the leagues, you know, they. they they started to create first, you know, the black leagues, where there were these these rumors of these fake black groups who were going to take over right, the city. It's right, it's it's right? fear mongering, yeah. Right. yeah. And then when that doesn't work, they create the Crescent City White League, which is right. put, which is a bunch of white supremacists put in in, in this, this group to defend the city against these black leagues, and and it goes on and on and on. Fifteen hundred men in this group, and you mentioned before yeah. when we talk a little bit here about. Um, you know, with the Canal Street coup, but I mean, it goes on and on and on. These guys led by a Confederate veteran, uh, Frederick yeah. Nosh Ogden, who was a hard yeah. reb guy, yeah. who's, who, for the most part, to your point, was he looks at Longstreet as the ultimate turncoat, the true he, he Confederate absolutely Judas. Does. Absolutely, and Longstreet, you know, the militia is 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 broken. You know, for, breaks ranks is overwhelmed. Longstreet will say. We just weren't ready that they outgunned us. We didn't have enough ammunition of, uh, you know, lots, lots of problems uh, 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 helped to account for that setback. And Longstreet is really, really shocked by all of this, sort of battered by it, you know, muses in interviews with the press that, you know, the Southern people are their own worst enemies, you know, uh, as, as he puts it. And, and he's so, um, this is also so hard to take that after this Canal Street battle, which essentially spells the end of, you know, the the, the, the beginning of the end of Reconstruction in, in, in New Orleans, uh, the, you know, the, the big arc of the story is that is that in the face of massive anti-Black terrorism by the Klan and White Leagues and so on, and in the face of a kind of Northern retreat, you know, just just sort of throwing up the hands and saying, well, there's, no, there's nothing we can do to keep the peace. Um, federal troops are removed by Rutherford B. Hayes from the South. And once the federal troops are gone, Reconstruction is in effect over. So at that point, Longstreet, sort of licking his wounds, leaves New Orleans and goes back to Georgia, to Gainesville, Georgia, where he has, has people and, and, and kinfolk and so on. And he, and he starts a new chapter. And th this chapter of his life, the post-New Orleans chapter, I found has been totally overlooked by biographers, mm -hmm. although it's a big, large chunk of his life. And and there, you know, he he continues to be active in Georgia politics. He wants to build a Republican Party in Georgia, although he doesn't have much luck with that. When there are Republican presidents in office and they have some patronage spoils to hand out, he's usually there, uh, you know, helping with that distribution, often favoring black political allies um, uh, in 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 Georgia. But he his his main sort of turn in that. In that last part of his life is is towards reconciliationism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's a on his mind uh, as as he as he starts to defend himself against all of the the, the you know incoming flack about his war record, um, mm -hmm. and as he starts to write his memoir, which is this incredible you know six hundred ninety page tome published in eighteen ninety six, in which he's trying to set the record straight. He really starts to feel like. Like uh, he's just being maligned uh, by 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 pe by ex Confederates who now you know they just keep escalating. They 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 basically get to the point where they are blaming him for the loss of the war. Yeah, and that's like the one the one thing that I take away from it is like to just all like when you're studying Longstreet, like you know, keep in mind that this stuff, his malignment, comes about you know eight years after the Civil War has ended. The, right exactly yeah and, and it's not and it continues it, it continues it and continues yeah. i mean it's kind of astonishing and of course there's no uh uh, uh evaluating and assessing a general's military performance and flaws in that performance is something that that uh you know we do in in, in the case of every major civil war leader and there's there's uh, all kinds of good reasons to do it and it's a valid thing to do but but in the case of longstreet the the the, the you know the stakes were so high the claims of failure and sabotage so exaggerated um you know and one of the things is previous biographers have sort of suggested that he was an inept politician who never really 
conveyed his own political wishes very well and that he was an inept defender of his own record and that that escalation that Mary's talking about happens because Longstreet bungled his own self-defense, you know? And and I, I, I found, I'm not persuaded by that argument. I found as I read his various essays and magazines and his memoir and all the interviews he loved to give that that he was a pretty he was a pretty formidable opponent for those for those earlies and Pendletons. He did all kinds of things to try to line up his own supporters and 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 uh, and you know base his defense in in careful study of the of the records and and point out out cases of special pleading. Uh, you know he loved to to argue that the early types were all you know military militarily second rate themselves and they were just trying to to, to gather the drippings of glory mm. from Lee's robes you know to paraphrase to paraphrase Longstreet and 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 as this you know endless as as you put it so so well they don't let up you know this just continues decade after decade right down to the present day in in a way um, as Longstreet does battle you know kind of on the page as i put it in the book about all this he does become more trenchant in his criticisms of lee he, he sort of hesitates at first um but by the time he writes the memoir he is really saying he's he's comparing lee and grant uh, and lee comes out the, the the worst for the comparison in longstreet's view Lee was a great general. Longstreet treasured his friendship with him, but he feels that at Gettysburg, Lee was off his balance, you know, lost his equipoise, as Longstreet puts it. His blood was up, various phrases to say that Lee was, was, you know, just as you guys have said, uh, uh, overestimating what con the Confederate troops could could do, underestimating his opponent. Um, Longstreet's critics would never forgive him for, for criticizing Lee and and the sort of you know the 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 dagger in a way was was the fact that longstreet said by comparison grant you know not the butcher not the man who just had all of the brute force at his disposal grant was the better general cuz he had a cool head as longstreet put it he was deliberate he didn't get thrown off his balance and again that's a comparison I, you know, I think a, a valid one, but one for which ex-Confederates who, again, to get back to point, points you both made earlier, the, the cult of Lee worship, there was just no room for, for you know, criticism of, of Lee. There was no middle, there's really no middle ground at this exactly. time for like, it's either you're, you're either for Longstreet or you're for Lee. Exactly. And in some ways I still find that is the case. Like you'll start talking yeah. about Longstreet and some it's like you're insulting Lee and it's very much, it's very divided. It's so interesting to see that some of the stuff that happens today, it's not just a new thing. It's been happening. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you know, of course it's a fascinating story and 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 uh, you know, in 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 works like Killer Angels, it's easy to see them as both as symbols, as symbols of you know mm -hmm. worldviews and so on. But but it is you know, Longstreet was I think he was he was uh, uh, you know hurt by the suggestion that 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 uh, he and Lee had not been friends, had not worked closely together, did not have mutual, uh, you know, uh, respect. Uh, and, 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 you know, the more hurt he got, the more willing he got to, 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 uh, you know, at times, at times target Lee. Now, having said that, um, part of the goal of Longstreet's last chapter of his life there in Georgia is, is to claw back some of his lost popularity among white Southerners. You know, he, 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 there's a lot of reasons for this. He's getting older and so on is, is one of them. But, but he, he does want to, you know, restore his reputation somewhat, defend himself against critics. He makes some allies, some powerful opinion makers at the Atlanta Constitution, a paper in, uh, in, in Georgia. Um, and, and he, he, you know, the memoir gets very good reviews in the North. There, there's a lot of criticism in the South, but also some grudging respect because Longstreet takes as his theme of the memoir reconciliation, the need to, for, you know, the two sides to come back, back together. And, and Longstreet begins to sort of fashion himself as a, as a kind of herald of reconciliation. I'm the guy who could see long before anyone else could that both sides were going to have to make some concessions if there was going to be peace, you know, uh, and so this is his self-image in the last part of his life, and 
and the, the reception of the memoir in the North really kind of reflects that image back to him. Uh, and, and he is able even to claw back some of his popularity among among white Southerners. So, but, you know, by the time he, he dies uh, after having held, you know, a series of of, of Republican patronage uh, positions, um, he is, he, you know, he has fashioned himself into a a guy who the public thinks of. And to me, this was very telling, you know, not only as a soldier, but as a statesman, you know, he's a kind of achieved that that reputation. And he, that's something he was very much you know, aiming for and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and succeeds in achieving. I think he took a lot of the, the reception he got, they got from Grant at Appomattox and realized yeah. he, in going, but even Robert E. Lee himself was promoting reconciliation before he died in 1870. He was talking about, you know, we need our, we need our sons more than ever now. We need to be part of it. And if you contrast how Longstreet behaved versus a John Brown Gordon in the next state over in Georgia, right, right. Mm -hmm. he was a guy who was a maintained being a Democrat but he wanted to play with the Republicans because what he wanted was he wanted Democrat home rule again. And the only right. way that was going to happen was if they had to give in a little bit versus Longstreet when he's in that fifth military district run by Phil Sheridan, he went the other way. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I mean, so again, made... it's, it's a, just, just as you said, home rule was a, was a, was a, uh, you know, euphemism for one party rule. You know, I mean, right. what the John Brown Gordons wanted and 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 Lee was no, you know, you're absolutely right that Lee, um, uh, uh, you know, spoke out on behalf of the need for peace. But he was he, he thought Grant's election was a terrible disaster right. and he loathed the Republican Party. That's a big difference between Lee and Longstreet. And Longstreet not only wrote his uncle Augustus, as you said, you know, as he was uh, uh, going public with a stand on reconstruction and heard from Augustus, oh, no, son, it'll ruin you. Don't do it. He also wrote Lee saying, hey, you know, this is what I'm going to do. It would do a lot of good for the peacemaking if you would step forward and also say, yeah, let's give reconstruction a chance. And Lee, you know, just rejected that out of hand. So that so you're right. You know, the difference comes down to Longstreet wanting a South in which there's two party competition. And a John Brown Gordon type saying, no, there's, you know, there's only room for, for, you know, for, for one, uh, uh, you know, one, one, uh, you know, ruling, ruling class, as it were, in, in, in the region. And Longstreet, when he did the, the unspeakable act of reaching out to the Benjamin Butlers of the world. Right, or, right, absolutely. Or, who was, a, who was a obviously loathed in New Orleans. Absolutely, not, yeah. Not only New Orleans, but because he was, you know, he was the one who originally was the one who gave the finger to the Fugitive Slave Act. Absolutely. And so I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it's such a good point. And, you know, the, the, I, I, I like writing about people who are who are mavericks. I wrote a, a book about a, a Civil War spy named Elizabeth Van Loon, mm -hmm. who was a you know white Richmond woman who spied for the Union. And, and you know, I, all kinds of reasons she went against, you know, the majority of people in her society and was such a committed unionist and eventually abolitionist. I did my best to explain it. But but there's also there was just a kind of orneriness in there, too. I mean, people's personalities matter. And Longstreet, sometimes he did kind of put his thumb in the eye of the other guys he, reaching out to Butler as an example. You know, he would, did things like participate in parades to celebrate the 15th Amendment, the enfranchisement of. Of, of African-American men going to a, you know, ceremony on uh, to, to mourn the death of Charles Sumner, the radical Republican. I mean, he really, you know, he 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 did not shy away from these symbolic acts of uh, of defiance, you know, which is really what, what, what they were. And as you said, for to, to give to be to befriend and praise in public Benjamin the Beast Butler, you know, these are unforgivable sins in the in the eyes of most uh, most, uh, uh, you know, former Confederates. And, you know, we've been talking around it. But essentially, at the heart of all this is, you know, the lost cause, this yes. this set of ideas that uh -huh. romanticized and glorified slavery in the Confederacy and then and then, you know, uh, uh uh demonized reconstruction, all, all three of those things, part of the lost cause creed and. Longstreet was just a, you know, a, again a, a threat to that lost cause outlook, and 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 was was uh, you know was 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 uh, was seen as such. Mm -hmm. Well, he went against, as you said, everything. Yeah, exactly. That, that they were trying for, exactly. including like you know he's pretty much speaking out against all of it because he just wants 
the reconciliation and the peace that, yeah, Grant, that wants Grant wants peace. as well. I, exactly. I think that's really what's 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 uh, oh. what's driving him. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, he says we have lost. Let us accept the terms. We are in. Do we are you know down bound to you know to honor yeah. them. And just yeah. that simple quote. But this is back at the very beginning for where he really went, went went deeper into it. But that was that was that was pretty much enough at that point. Um, and then obviously supporting Grant in the election, which he really yeah. supported Grant. Yeah, and, he did. And, and, and that's all the log on the anti-Lee fire for the, for the for those people. Absolutely. The, the Taylors, oh, absolutely. The, all of them. And so I always wondered, even before your book, and you, your book actually filled in a lot of gaps I have with Longstreet, but, but I always wondered, looking at him, did he befriend the Butlers and the Sheridans and the Grants because he felt, because he was such a high-ranking confederate that it would people look at him and say if he can do it maybe we can too or did he just do it because he just felt that you know damn the torpedoes i think this is right i this is what we need to do yeah and, i think you know it's i think it's a moving target sort of answer i think he thought they were men of honor you know who had who had proven their their medal on the battlefield but i also think that um Here's a fascinating contrast. So he writes the letters. Confederates say, you're Judas. We wish you died at the wilderness. What do the Republicans do? They welcome him with open arms. And they say, you were a great general, you know, and and, and it suits them to say you were a great general because the more important general he was during the war, the more important convert he is as a symbol, as you've said. Right. Of, of the that the, of, of the possibility of changing Southern hearts and minds, you know, so he he. It, 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 he he moves uh, it, it into the Republican camp and stays there because the Confederates are being are being you know so categorical on this issue of loyalty. It's like you cannot be a Republican and a Confederate. You have to be one or one or another. Is literally quoting a Mobile paper. Whereas the Republicans say, yeah, we could finesse the issue of loyalty. Yeah, you were a Confederate. We didn't like we didn't like that, but you are a really good general, and that means you're extremely useful to our cause and we we respect you as a as a as a military man this is while his former yeah. allies are running down his military career so so there's a, there's a you know part of this story i'm telling is of a bunch of different stakeholders in reconstruction who have different interests but who see each other as mutually useful and longstreet will have all these interesting alliances cuz he sees his allies as useful they see him as useful to me this suggests that he's quite a skilled politician. Again, his previous biographers have said he's a bungling politician. Well, you know, I, I was suspicious of that to begin with for one reason, and that is I don't think you get to become a, a very important general and, and sustain that role without being a good politician. You know, the, the, the people mm -hmm. like to separate war and politics, but they're never, sep they're no. never separate. Um, and then, you know, second of all, he wouldn't have been able to, get one after another patronage post. I mean, this is a guy who less than 15 years after the Civil War is made an ambassador of the United States to Turkey. You know, the the the, the, the foreign language press, the German, the, the uh, uh, French and English papers are like, are you kidding me? I mean, you Americans are amazing. This guy tried to destroy your country 13 years ago and now he's an ambassador. You know, it's just, it, you know, so you tell me that that the guy wasn't a skilled politician. I mean, he, you know, he 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 pulls off these amazing reinventions, mm -hmm. you know, again and again. Yeah, and you speaking know. of reinventions, he goes back to his West Point party days in Turkey. He ends up having yeah, to come right, back. So right, right, exactly. Runs out of money, yeah, you know? exactly. So, yeah. so it's funny. But I, I was, you know, you mentioned be, be, being a general. You got to be a good politician, but you have to be pretty confident in yourself too. You I, I always thought it was fascinating. He converts to Catholicism, Catholicism yeah, right before he yeah. goes to Turkey. And he gets in that hot water with those mercenaries trying to hand out the yeah. Bibles. And, yeah. and I, I, I always I see those little things in, in about how he feel, what he feels is right should be the way it should be done. And I think, go especially going overseas, I think it was, I think he found out that he, you know, being a politician here versus overseas is, is, a, is a lot different. Yeah, but he, he, but, he definitely but, wanted to get home, but he, but he, but he, you know, this, the, although that little chapter abroad was a short chapter of his life, it helps build this image of him as a statesman, as a guy who's now representing the U.S. abroad. You know, he's very, very proud of that role. The Catholicism piece is fascinating. And to the extent that we know why he did it, his second wife and others have speculated that, you know, this is a guy who just had dealt with a lot of tragedy and sadness in his life. And he felt that the Catholic Church was just particularly 
you know, good at helping the heartbroken, if you will, you know, I'm sort of paraphrasing what his second wife yeah. said. So that's why I was surprised that he didn't converse in his early 62 when those, when his four kids got the yeah, scarlet yeah, fever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He became more religious at that point. He, you know? he, he did, yeah. but he also became much more fiery. He wrote that, yeah. he decided to, he started to turn into a college football coach on game day. And when really he was getting articles posted in the, in the, the Richmond papers, and it really became a very pro Confederate. He turned inward to deal with all that tragedy but you, you can see at the end of the day Longstreet is somebody I think he, he in, in his heart of hearts he really felt that he was doing what he thought was right all the way yeah. through no matter what yeah. he did any aspect of his life but I think yeah. un unlike a lot of people in it's even today's in today's mindset it's hard to say you were wrong and we need to move on for anybody yeah it, exactly well that's what makes the story so amazing and kind of timely at this at this moment it just seems mm -hmm. like admitting you were wrong is something that that um that you know american leaders find it very very hard to do i mean you know there's some other nice examples from the civil war you know Grant, uh, uh, lincoln initially uh uh being sort of skeptical about grant's plan for vicksburg and then when when the grant pulls it off lincoln says hey you know what you were right and i was wrong it's like imagine yeah. you know what what human not lovely humbleness to be able to say that but longstreet uh, you know, was was able to to do that and to say, um, you know, as he puts it, you know, our, our old ideas, again, we appeal to the sword to sort of sort this out. The old ideas are obsolete. So so let's let's try something new, you know, um, and and uh, and he was and, and I think he he persisted in this feeling that Southerners were their own worst enemies. That is to say, they weren't doing things, opening Southern society up modernizing the economy, you know, making room for a real two-party competition, uh, uh, giving everyone a stake in society by, by, by letting them vote. They weren't doing these things that would, would just, you know, demonstrably benefit them if only, if right. only they would, would, would try them. So, so he, um, you're right. He did have a, he did have, I think, a surprising degree of self-confidence, uh, you know, uh, about all that. Yeah. And I just, you know, I again like you know admitting you know we were wrong but then yeah he just he sticks by what he says and I yeah. do think you know what he sees with aligning himself with Grant Grant sees that as well aligning you know not really like aligning himself with Longstreet this could be beneficial this could help us bring the country 100%. back together a, yeah. it's, it's a, a politically point and yeah I de definitely agree with you that he I have always thought Longstreet was a great politician because yeah how else would he how else do you explain how else would you yeah. yeah 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 no i think that's an it's an excellent point that and i'm glad you made it that that grant sees has his uses for long street too you know i my previous book called armies of deliverance argues that northerners essentially you know fought the war to as they saw it to to kind of break the spell the secessionists had set over the southern masses and 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 rekindle the allegiance of the southern masses and and they kind of clung to that belief even in the face of a lot of evidence that the southerners you know didn't didn't want didn't want to be you know have their hearts and minds change but but longstreet is a symbol of this persistence of this belief that maybe we can bring these people around and this country can be based on you know bonds of affection again rather than on you know forms of coercion and occupation and so on and so grant does see longstreet in, in that light as a mm. symbol of that hope, which is one gr that Grant clings to very, very mm. keenly. Yeah, yeah and, and he's certainly not the only one, but I think what, what your book does a great job explaining is the contrast. And, and, yeah. and what, you, what you're talking about a guy who was grabbing free blacks, you know, and pulling them yeah, into the Confederate. So yeah, this, yeah, this, yeah. Was a, this, was a, this was a guy who would show his, that he was the nephew of Augustus many, many times. Absolutely. And, 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 and had his really dark moments at different he times. He did, absolutely. But, so, you know, so just, it's always, and, and your book is great because it talks about that. It doesn't yep. it doesn't hide from it. It talks about it. Um, but when the war ends, he, I mean, he, I, I can't think of anybody in probably, I can't think of anybody in, in military history or in political history who does such a 180 from yeah, what he was. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important to note that he's not the only white Southerner who decides to give the Republicans a chance. There's some white Southerners who, for various reasons, um, 
overwhelmingly motivated by desire for economic gain, not not any particular sympathy for African Americans, but but nonetheless, there are white Southerners who give the Republicans a chance, but none of them are nearly as important or controversial as Longstreet because they weren't rebel number three. You know what I mean? He, the right. fact that he was so high up meant that in the eyes of the lost cause types, he was setting a particularly dangerous example. Yeah. Um, uh, you know uh, that that others might might uh, might follow. So he 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 he's uh, and and you know part of a big po- a big point of the book. This is really getting down into the weeds, but it is it is important is that the white Southerners who decided to give the Republicans a chance were in a really important part of that coalition that governs the South during Reconstruction. But they were also, you know, alas, the weak link in the coalition because they were they were susceptible to pressure and ostracism and to, you know, uh, the d- Democrat lost cause type saying, come back to the fold, you know, we'll reward you if you do uh you know or punish you if you don't and 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 to although longstreet doesn't doesn't you know re- retreat completely from reconstruction he does step back in that last phase of his life from the advanced position he had taken uh in mm-hmm. new orleans mm-hmm. and then he tries to reinvent his life again by marrying helen dorsch from age yeah. 74. Uh, i mean that's what it's a wild story she's a georgia journalist much younger than him, you know, he gets a lot of flack from his political enemies, you know, robbing the cradle, whatever. Um, he he defends the marriages she does as a real partnership. She becomes a big defender of his of his military record. And then I, I said a few words about this, but I really do hope somebody comes along and writes the Helen Dorch Longstreet uh biography it needs to be someone who's really a historian of the 20th century because she lives until 1962. Yeah. And um, uh, she, um, you know, she has her own kind of, you know, uh, conversion where around World War II, she becomes a real advocate of black civil rights when she hadn't hadn't been that before. So, uh, uh, you know, fascinating, uh, you know, fascinating story. How many yeah. people have, who outlived their husband by 58 uh, years? I mean, my God, absolutely. And she really... And, and, and- and Long, Longstreet's last days were not good ones health wise. You know, no, he had no, can- no. cancer of the eye. Oh. He ends up dying. You know, he drops. He, he ends, he's only about one hundred thirty pounds when he dies. He loses a yeah. lot of weight. Dies of pneumonia. So it's 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 sad the way the way it goes. But um, but he's to, right up in right up until right then he's still trying to he's working with under Wade Hampton's yeah. own job there as a commissioner of the railroad. This yeah. is a guy who just kept going and because he energized the body up. He really was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he keeps going and going, and 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 uh, you know, after he dies, he, and he's not there to defend himself anymore. You know, it continues to be open season on his wartime record, and Helen tries somewhat in vain to to uh, to to defend him. You know, as she, as she sees it, um, but as we've said all along, he remains controversial down to the present day, and and. And came up a lot recently as we've been thinking about statues and memorialization, because, of course, except for in Gainesville, his hometown and and Gettysburg, where there's one rather awkward statue of him, um, the South was not blanketed with Longstreet statues. And the reason is obvious. It's all the things we've been talking about. He wasn't useful as a symbol of the lost cause or white supremacy or slavery or any of the, the rest because of the position he took uh, during Reconstruction. So he is kind of the exception that proves the rule. That those statues had political messages, you know. Uh, yep. uh, so yeah, it's 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 just you know super super uh, fascinating. Yeah, I like that you made that point in your book too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, like I mean, it's you know, it's very very all yeah. all very very uh, very relevant. Yeah. yeah. And, and for, for the record, I like the statue of Gettysburg. I like like that one. <laughs> I mean, it's but yeah, I've heard people say it looks like you know it, it belongs on a carousel or something. Yeah. But it, well, it's, Charles, it's, Charles Spennell, the sculptor, is, does a lot of work. He's still down there, great yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and what's good about him is if you have questions about the sculpt, he'll meet you out there and explain to you why he did it. So it's, yeah, it's yeah, pretty yeah. neat. So, yeah, but I mean, I, you know, it, it it is pretty cool. But I I think what's again what's great about your book is you, there is definitely a Lee, ver- especially speaking of Gettysburg, there's a Lee versus Longstreet thing, and I notice every time we go because we go to Gettysburg all the time, the winds change and it goes back and forth. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Right now we're on a Lee wave, and it tends yeah. to go back and forth. But I think when you when you study when you study not just that battle, we realize a lot of people focus on Gettysburg. I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But when you look at a lot of the things Longstreet did, especially going west, Chickamauga, yeah, yeah, not, not a great day in Knoxville, but again, as a tough yeah. spot. But again, like Lee, 
what the post-war man is very different from the wartime man but i think um i think so much has been done by the by the the, the, the walter taylors of the world the right, marshes right. of the world um the jubal earlies of the world the d.h hills of the world that it creates this historical memory this narrative yeah, yeah. and, and it, it likes like so many things once that narrative gets into your head that's what it is it's fact yeah right exactly and i mean part of the, the point of my book is to say you know, the South was a complicated place. And, and what this story shows, among other things, is the kind of elusiveness of reconciliation between Southerners, you know, uh, uh, who had different interpretations of what of what of what the war, uh, you know, of what the war meant and and and, uh, you know, tried to kind of reduce these critics tried to reduce Longstreet into this kind of one dimensional guy when he was multidimensional, you know, and the, and the, and the complexity is always to me more interesting than some, some, you know, simplified, you know, one dimensional view. Yeah. I, no, yeah, I, I completely agree. He's, and it's a very human story too. Like that's the thing is it's human and it's, it's one that um, what, re what I really love about it is just the mm -hmm. reminder from your book that we have to study these guys post Civil War too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, and I mean, it, it gets it's you know, Lee of course dies in eighteen seventy, so there yeah. isn't a long post Civil War. But for so many of these guys, I have to say, shout out here to my friend and and fellow historian Joan Waugh, who wrote a great book about U.S. Mm -hmm. Grant that was really a model for this book. In that in that there's you know good coverage of everything up until the end of the war, but it's really the post war war story uh you know un under known underappreciated post-war story that's that's the focus and memory and and public image and debates the way a person becomes a you know you know a, a major figure in a kind of symbolic battlefield um that that book was a big inspiration to me and 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 its main my main takeaway from that book was yes let you know all of these guys the post-war careers deserve a second close look and of course you know old subjects are always worth taking a new look at but for many reasons one of which is that we have tools at our disposal we didn't have i mean the digitization of letters and diaries yeah. and newspapers the ability to keyword search and figure out you know where longstreet was on some random day and in, in some you know whatever to just track his movements in a way that would have been impossibly yeah. painstaking and time consuming back in the day you know, uh, it, it's just an exciting time to be a to be a historian. It's probably a good good ending note, but it, it really is yep. a oh, uh, it is. you know, and we and we really, um, you know, as I said, we uh, book authors so appreciate podcasts like this one because uh, you know, getting the word out about books is 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 super important, and and uh, and and you know, we put a lot of work into uh, writing them, and it's just it's just great to have you know friends to help us. Uh, uh, you know, find an audience for them. No, well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us for this episode. Uh, it was amazing to talk to you. And just for our listeners, um, and we were joined by Dr. Elizabeth Varon, and her book is Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Defied the South. It was released last week, November the 21st. And we already know from talking to some people that they've been reading it and enjoying it. So that's good. Wonderful. Glad to hear that. We've been beating the drum for this book for a while, but it's thank an you. honor to have you all this. We love, we love having uh a tr tr you know true historians on who who realize that that these people these men they they have their fears they have their dreams they have their families their lives they're not just a line on a map and they're not just a crusty yeah. black and white picture these are people and like i say many times the civil war was not that long ago it really wasn't right. and um you mentioned before that helen died in 1962 and that was yeah, jfk yeah. was president back then it's exactly. amazing to think about. It's wild. well well you in, in but I don't know, some some probably something like seven years. I'll be back to talk about Clara Barton, who's my current. Her, yeah, yes. talk about yes. oh my god, talk about a life. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> she dies a you know few days before the Titanic sinks, and uh, uh, is uh, is in every global hot spot where there's a crisis. You know, over the course of her amazing Red Cross career. So I'll I'll, I'll look forward to coming back and telling you all about oh, her. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you, you may yeah. stop in your old your old uh, Wellesley College stomping grounds again if you're in the exactly. Yeah, yeah. Love, love, <laughs> love New England. Love New England. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks, right. guys.
Well, again, Thank thanks you. so much. Thank, thanks so much, Elizabeth Barron, for joining us. Uh, definitely read her book. We'll talk about this soon, many, many times. It's definitely, I think it's a it's a it's a signature piece on a really understudied subject. I mean, Jeffrey Wirtz got his book, and there's a lot of books out it's there. But great, I think, great but book, I, but there's but, always but I, room for for more. Right, but I, I think I think what what your book did for me was it filled in a lot of gaps, which is great. And and you and you went. You're, and I, I tell people, if you, if you like Longstreet and, and you just and all you care about is Gettysburg or Second Manassas, that you're going to learn a lot about a lot of politics and a lot of post-war. But that's really where the sweet spot is with him. Because it it yeah, really yeah. ties his whole life together. So, again, it's an honor to have you with us. We'll definitely mm -hmm. look forward to having you on again. And um, hopefully people enjoy this as well. But if you haven't read the Great. book, go out and get it. Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy it. Thank okay. you. Happy holidays to you both. Yeah, thank you. And thanks cool. to our listeners for joining us for episode 119. And we will be back with you for episode 120. Well, hold on. What's, what's coming up for us? What's next? All oh, right. We're doing an episode about Hiram Granberry. Um, That's right. Just to tie into the 160th for the battles for Chattanooga, which were a few days ago, as well as Ringgold Gap, as well as for the 159th anniversary of the Battle of Franklin. So, so we're going to be... stay on the Reb side, back to back Reb. Thank Speaking you. Of Hiram yeah. Another, yeah. Another, yeah. another guy who spent some time in Massachusetts. Yeah. Cranberry. Different, different. Type All right. Of we will you know. see y'all next time. Peace out, everybody. Awesome. Thank you.